Hello, welcome to the world of Word. Coming up, another word in your attic. And if you enjoy this, visit our Patreon to find out more about our exclusives and our general work of national importance. The link is in the notes below. And now, on with the show. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Welcome to Word in Your Attic. This is number 50, I think I'm right in saying that, according to Alex's uh, working out in the background. It's is astonishing, right? isn't it? It's astonishing. Our work of national importance, Dave, <laughs> has reached. <laughs> We're doing this on behalf of the nation. We <laughs> Keep the old balloon in the air. Yeah, so when did, we, when did we start? We, well, I don't March, know. I suppose. Was it March? Yeah, it must, must have been mid-March. Must have been yeah. mid-March we started. Whenever uh, and started. then we had a few kind of guests, and we had Jude, and we had uh, uh, the gentleman Rhymer, and we had Tom, Mark we had Billingham. Mark Billingham. And, uh, and then it kind of it grew out of that. And so we thought, if you'll indulge us, we'd mark number 50. Because we've been sitting there watching all these people producing old tat from their attics for the last two, three months, thinking, I've got one of those, or I've got something I'd like to show. And we're, we're going to devote this one to our own attics, our own clutter, okay? So if you'll, if you'll indulge us, that's what we'll do. Because I've been, I, you know, I, I couldn't help finding all sorts of stuff has turned up at my feet in the last few weeks. There's a copy of Frank Ifield's She Taught Me How to Yodel. Uh, Frank oh, Ifield, of course, a uh, much underrated artist. I think is ripe for a revival. That's I've also brilliant. seen... I've got to shut the window flexes. as somebody mowing the lawn. Hang on. Okay, very <laughs> there we are. There's more flexies I found this morning. This is the loneliness of the long playing record. That is a private eye flexi. Do you remember oh, private well, I eyes? Do, I do remember them. You used to have loads of flexies. And, yeah, um, they used to do brilliant impersonations of David Frost. Remember yes, that? all that kind of thing. And then I couldn't resist hauling out of its place behind the piano. Something that, actually, you know that woman Marie Kondo, the uh, Japanese woman who's had best-selling books about teaching people how to get rid yeah. of clutter? And uh, doesn't she say, if you don't want it straight away and it isn't beautiful, get rid of it you know just absolutely bin it and so that's no doubt very good advice but what maria kondo didn't factor in is there would be at some point let's say the year 2020 there will be a worldwide pandemic everybody will be stuck in their attics and therefore there will be a once in a lifetime opportunity to show off all the rubbish that you've got and actually give people a certain amount of pleasure and here's my pride of place, okay? Can you see this? This is... Oh, it's your Bob. Yeah, I remember that. Yes. This is an absolutely huge... I can barely kind of manage it. I'm going to have to disappear behind So that was a shop window display item, I assume, wasn't this? it? <laughs> I'll show you. I'll put it down, and then I'll talk. Um, that was in the window of the HMV shop, Oxford Street when bob marley's second album burning came out that not bob marley it's the whalers wasn't it, it was i think yeah. it was called the whalers and uh, and that must have been i think 1973 i may be wrong certainly around about there and in those days certain record companies used to pay quite a bit of money to do shop window displays in in big prestige stores you know to mark the release of records and so the island had this uh, burning um a, you know display it's meant to look like a shack in trench town i think you know so that's that's kind of i don't know what that is hardboard or whatever and um and my friend God, it's i don't made want, of wood Fantastic. oh yes i thought it was carbon that's wood no it's it's solid that's solid i mean you can break it but you know it is fairly solid um and i wasn't working there at the time it was just before i started there but my friend steve um, he, at the end of the display period, he said, I think I'll have that, you know, because they didn't want it back. He said, throw things away. So he took it home and it sat in his flat for ages. And years later, Steve emigrated to Australia many, many years later and left it behind. Sadly, and, you know, 20 years ago, nearly now, Steve died. And, and a friend and I just had to clear out 
a few of his effects that were still left in the UK. And that was the thing that I took, I took away as a kind of bit of souvenir. My son then yeah, took- Yeah, Henry had it at university. Took it to university. Right. Because it was the coolest possible thing you could have in your, you know, your student room at university as a, as a kind of a a souvenir. Four foot <laughs> Marley Guy That's with right. a split, you know. That's right. But also it's from 1973, which, you know, lends it a kind of <laughs> authenticity that, you know, if you had the same thing, you got it last week, it wouldn't quite be the same. And so for the last few years, it's been sitting behind the piano at home, um, waiting to see what its ultimate fate is likely to be. And uh, anyway, there it is. You know, That's fantastic. It's shown to the world. And, uh, you know, I'm very pleased, you know, despite what Marie Kondo might say, I'm very pleased that we've hung on to it. All for that this, time. For this moment. Yeah. <laughs> for this moment, you know. Perfect. And, uh, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's still sort of rattling around the family in some way in 40, 50 years. You know, somebody will be holding it out and say, my, I never met my grandfather, but I understand that he had a friend who got this, you know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. By then, it'll be so valuable, it'll be framed behind sh a sheet of perspex, you know. Well, I, I have had people... low temperature. I have had people say, oh, you really ought to put that in a museum or something. I, I, I don't know what the appropriate museum would be to give it to. But uh, anyway, so shop display items. Have you got anything like that? Well, I've got, I've, I've got the... Hang on a second. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh. Oh, it's competitive, is it? I see. Here he goes. Just happened to have. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, this. Mighty. Actually, I don't know if I can get far enough away to be able to show you what it looks like. There it is. It's a giant Radio Times cover. With Bob Dylan. With Bob Dylan on the front. Isn't that amazing? And how did you get that? That was from a literary festival I went to with Mark Billingham, and we just saw it. So there was, I think it might have been the Radio Times Festival, actually. Right. And, uh, yeah, they had mocked it up. And at the end of it, I went up and asked them, I said, do you want that? It's never going to throw it away. I thought, I'll take that and give it to my wife. It, I mean, to be fair, it hasn't done much problem sitting up in the attic because there's nowhere in the house you can really see. Big enough. And it's not a, a lovely artefact like yours. It's got a genuine thing made out of wood. Or, but it's rather fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. A giant yeah. Bob Dylan. Yeah. It's good. Do you know, it's just struck me I've got something else. I don't know. You've got, have you got one? Oh, I've got that. It's Doggy Dog by Joni Mitchell. Because you had it framed. Oh. That is signed by Jenny Mitchell. We went to a little um, uh, kind of uh, playback thing she did. Actually, it was a performance, wasn't it? It was a promo thing. She played she, songs. She did. A, there was a place near the Albert Hall, I remember. Yeah. A very curious kind of club, art gallery sort of place. And she played a load of songs from Doggy Dog. And then she played... A, Kind of greatest hits, didn't she? Greatest hits, it was and amazing. she was sensationally good, wasn't it? Incredibly good. And if you think about it, actually, at that time, she wasn't quite. And as with all these people, you know, her whole kind of profile was at a fairly low ebb, wasn't it? No, really? definitely. She wasn't, she wasn't the kind of massive event that she is now. That no, just no, no. Hushed and revered uh, tones, but well, oh, it was very thrilling. There was only about fifty of us there. Do you remember? Yeah, but, yeah. So. This used to have glass in the front, and I think it got broken for some reason, uh, somehow. Probably my kids throwing things at each other yeah. when they were at the stage of throwing things at each other. I have to be honest, of, and I do like some of Joni Mitchell's stuff. I don't like that one that much. No, no, that's the thing. We never put it up on the wall. Because <laughs> well, your wife never put it on the wall because she's a painter and she's got slightly higher standards. We're easily impressed down here, you know. <laughs> yeah, Joni Mitchell. Somewhere down there in terms of uh, artistic <laughs> credibility, yeah. apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me what else I've found. You see that? The Radio Luxembourg Book of Record Stars. Fantastic. This is an annual that I got. It must have been Christmas 1963. And it, it's, oh yeah, there it is. Christmas 1963. Oh, to David from Marcia. Oh, good grief. Friend of the family. And uh, it's got the most a terrible kind of succession of ghost-written pieces by the likes of Acker Bilk and Mike Sarn. And, yeah, and yeah. then occasional, occasional kind of concessions to what's going on, like Nashville on Mersey by Jerry and the Pacemakers. You know, that was the, 
the first flush of Beatlemania. But unbelievably, it's still kind of hung together. And there you are at the back. You get a plug for the world's greatest stars on parade every week in, in the, the News Express. Express. Is there that built with the with the hat on? It is. So it? there are the. See yeah. how many how many people can you recognize? Well, I can see Ackerbilt rep- immediately with a little goatee. We have Frank Ifill, Frank Sinatra, Cliff Richard, Richard Chamberlain, Elvis Presley, Adam Faith, Billy Fury. God, who is this? It's not Ellen Shapiro. Hank Marvin. Well, was there an old Bruce. gag at the time? Uh, instead of saying, "How do you think I feel?" You go. There was an old gag at the time that people, instead of saying, how do you think I feel? People would say, how do you Frank I feel? Oh, really? It was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Ray yeah. Charles, Ken, Kenny Ball, Acker Bilk, Jet Harris, Pat Boone, Frankie Vaughan, Lonnie Donegan, the Everly Brothers and Joe Brown. That's a that's great the world, collection. That's the world of the New Musical Express. Uh, pretty much all blokes there. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So have you got anything like that? No, well, I've got a few. Uh, I've, I've got a, a my very. I was trying to find my first record that I bought. Oh, go on. Which, go of on. course, was uh, Bernard Cribbins' Hole on the Ground. Uh, I couldn't find it for the simple reason that me and my three elder sisters used to club together and buy records every every week with our pocket money, democratically elected. And I've got such fond memories of that time before the Beatles. I mean, I was born in the 50s, so I can just about remember Elvis Presley and Bobby V and Johnny Tillotson and the big rock and roll stars and the instrumental groups and all the novelty hits, you know. It was a great time. And this is one of the ones I found, which is Helen Shapiro. Oh, Helen. And I, we loved Helen oh. Shapiro. We thought she was fantastic. This is Goody Goody and uh, Birth of the Blues, but she did Walking Back to Happiness. We thought she was fantastic. We thought she was absolutely amazing, and she, she and, and she was only fourteen, the same age as my elder sister. Oh, just hold it up, it. hold it up. A career again, that's that. going to last forever, and uh, and then has. she was uh, uh, deposed by yeah. obviously the man who <laughs> produced Bernard Cribbins and, and uh, Peter Sellers and all the others. And we, I've still got loads of these old EPs. They're fantastic. It was lovely no again having. Three, three elder sisters, they had a fight over which Beatle was your favourite Beatle. The best bit in the Craig Brown book about the Beatles, I think, is the chapter about when the Beatles go on tour with Helen Shapiro. Yes. Supporting her. Supporting her. And then they're withdrawn from the tour halfway through because they're just too big. They're too big, they're blowing her off stage. And, and, uh, and so it's a very kind of sympathetic portrait of Helen Shapiro as just being somebody who was 14 years old and appeared to have the world at her feet and then somebody just came along it just completely stole her thunder yeah but she yeah. was a huge star huge she star. Was absolutely still around star. still around clearly but this this I was just going to show you a few of these this this is what prompted the got me interested in the Beatles and uh, uh, an obsession that continues to this day and I still have tons of what are now utterly valueless and useless bootlegs up in the attic, oh, cool. and uh, there's one. This is the old butcher sleeve uh, oh, with wow. all sorts of outtakes of Beatles' um, uh, performance back in the day. This is uh, our studio outtakes: Teddy Boy with John Lennon. Just to get back sessions. So uh, when the black you... album somewhere, the black album is great, which is a double album like the white album with a little serial number on the front print. It's got alternative pictures. It's got an alternative poster. And it's got outtakes. I mean, it's really, really an absolute labour of love. So when would you have bought those? I bought these in the, um, I suppose I bought them in the 80s, would it have been? Yeah, probably I about the know. 80s. Paid a fortune. This is the Decca Sessions, which is fantastic. Recorded <laughs> on the 1st of January 1982. This is the thing that didn't get them a record deal. Do you remember? <laughs> and it's just lovely when you look at it. You think they, they came from that whole showbiz pre, kind of almost pre rock and roll world, didn't they? You know, that yeah, kind of music yeah. hall. You know, they're playing things like Sheik of Araby. Um, do you remember Len- Lennon singing that? I'm the Sheik of Araby. At, at, at night, uh, 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 when you're asleep, into your tent. Into I'll your creep. tent. Not off. Creep. Not <laughs> off. He does it's the Alan Freeman impersonation. Not anymore. No, 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 they wouldn't do that now. No, no. Talk, talk, about a song, <laughs> talk about a song you couldn't do nowadays. Cultural you really appropriation could. I know. as sexual predator. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Terrible. Go on, what else you got? I found this. I don't know if I showed you this. Back in the day, when you bought records in the 50s and 60s, and this is obviously before the advent of Virgin and, and H&V and Every Corner and all that kind of stuff, uh, and uh, and probably slightly before Boots and Smith started to sell records, you tended to buy them at a local music dealer. And every town, every small town in Britain, would have one place where you could buy a piano accordion, or you could get 
you know, a flute or, and you can get sheet music. You can get the, uh, you know, the, the score to My Fair Lady or all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so they would start stock, stocking records. So when you bought a record, and, the, and this, is, this is the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand. So this is... This is uh, yeah, it came in the package, didn't it, from that particular shop? From that shop. And yep. they, would, they would, you know, throw away the parlophone sleeve or whatever, because it would just probably, probably be a plain one at that point. Yeah, right? and advertise themselves. And advertise themselves. And so this is a shop called C.T. Orty, the music shop, in inverted commas, as if that's such an unusual expression. We have to explain it, you know. For everything musical... Uh, and they were they were at fourteen, uh, twelve and fourteen, the arcade Dewsbury. Can you see that? That's fantastic. And that's... Ours was Clark's Electric in Fleet, Hampshire. <laughs> oh, right. Clark's Electric sold two bar electric fires. It sold Hoover's. It sold um, you know uh, very basic electric kitchen equipment. And there was a little guy who looked like a member of um, you know uh, of Herman's Hermits with slightly long hair but a shirt and tie. Who had a little box of records, <laughs> and you got a six and eight for six and eight. Was it three for a pound? Six and eight. This, yeah. uh, these are other early Beatles uh, records. This is "Can't Buy Me Love." So there you got, you know, the kind of proper parlor phone sleeve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, in those days, you had advertising on the back. Yeah, and so that would be a cartoon featuring the adventures of Fran the Fan she called Fran the Fan and she is there to persuade you of the uh, of the uh, the attractions of having a Morphe Ridges Morphe Ridges hairdryer to get you know your proper sophisticated swinging 60s your look your bouffant look to look like Helen Shapiro actually yeah with absolutely your, with your white plastic ear uh, you know earrings that's another, that's, another, that's another Beatles one this Ticket to Ride and that is Miner's Makeup on the bank and so oh yeah wonderful people think that you know that um, people know that musicians only started taking advertisers shilling recently that's not the case it was going on actually we talked about this the other day did we talk about uh jonathan richmond's roadrunner yeah, we did and uh, and i said that this is <laughs> my only creative decision i ever took in a, in a record company which was i worked for berserkly records in 1976, 77, and we put out Jonathan Richmond's uh, Roadrunner with his version on one side and the Modern Lovers version on the other side. And that was my idea. And I said, and you could call it Roadrunner once, Roadrunner Road Runner twice. twice. Yes. Try Genius. It, it was. It Genius. was. Genius. Ticks every box. That's brilliant. It's Promote a... that man immediately. Give him a company car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or the company, company bicycle. Car. Give yeah. him a... Definitely a big company bicycle. And I also found from my Berserkly souvenirs, I found this the other day. This is a box of a singles. A box of singles. A box of singles as they came from the factory. And so that's a box of 25 copies of the modern, Jonathan Richmond of the Modern Lovers Egyptian reggae. Which you can knock out quite cheaply, I'm sure now. I'm sure there's still, still huge demand. <laughs> I if I took it to a rare, took it to a rare record shop, they probably so you got twenty five of them. That's amazing. Well, there'd be something like twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be twenty five in a box. So what else? Have you got anything? Well, and I've got a few. I mean, most of these are things that just meant a lot to me. Actually, this is just key record for me at the time. Do you remember oh, this? Oh, David Grant. Oh, I love nineteen sixty four. This is how I discovered Bob Dylan. This is the man who, um, you know, I, it was through him that I discovered Lead Belly and all those folk records and lovely old blues records, you know. But he did a version of Don't Think Twice, It's All Right by, by, by Bob Dylan. And that, oh, really? for me, started me off on this whole thing of, of getting a harmonica and a little metal coat hanger. Oh, did singing, you yeah, have yeah. Did oh, the whole you number. do that? And what I discovered you... was, I, know, oh, I discovered God. three, I got three of these books of songs that I, I, uh, I, I compiled. Can you see these? Look. So here are all the little, uh, you know, the chords and the lyrics to the so, songs. So these are Bob Dylan songs, songs are they? They're mostly Bob Dylan songs. There we are, look. You know, this is a Cat to Cat Stevens song. It's, I Shall Be Released by Bob Dylan, Simon and Garfunkel, Cocaine <laughs> Blues, Richland Woman Blues. It's fantastic. So I've got, your, yeah, your mum said, what are you doing upstairs? Oh, I'm just transcribing cocaine blues. Cocaine blues, that's right. I'm down for my tea in a minute, mum. I've got hundreds of them. There they all are. You know, the partisan, John Barleycorn, Universal Soldier, oh. Motherless Child, Death Don't Have No Mercy in This Land, Mr. Bojangles. 
singles. It's brilliant. And I say, I, 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 so I painstakingly used to write down the lyrics to all these things, all the chords and just to learn all the songs. Yeah. Which is very good. Very yeah, good. Well, it, it, you know, it, it, with so much of the stuff, you're reminded that there used to be a gap in our knowledge, which is now occupied by the internet. So if you want to know the words of anything, you can find them, you know, it's the yeah. easiest thing in the world. It didn't used to be easy. But I, I found this, and I don't know if this, this rings any particular bells with you. Do you remember that? Do you have this? You never, obviously never the had music. No, I don't think This I did, is the no. New Musical Express Illustrated Encyclopedia of Rock, compiled by Nick Logan and Bob Woffenden. And, uh, and this came out, I think, 1973. And this was a time when there were hardly, uh, well, this edition, I think it was republished, 76 or something. And, uh, and um, there were hardly any reference books in those days. And so, you know, if you wanted to know how many records Argent had made or whatever. That was your only way of finding out? <laughs> it was pretty much your only way of finding out. And you'd have to hope that it hadn't been... So it's the equivalent of Halliwell's in the event. film world. Yeah. So, Argent, there you go. Okay. <laughs> There you go. So, and I asked him about Argent. Yeah. And it was, it, it was, um, it was good, but compared to reference works today, it would be considered very superficial. But the thing we used to really puzzle about for years is who's that group on the cover? Oh God, do you know the answer? I do know the answer. It's but I bet that. there's a lot of people who don't know. And so I'm going to... I'm going I can't to throw... really see them clearly. No, though. okay. It's, it's, well, gonna... How obscure are they? Very obscure. Uh, not, not, well, not that obscure. Um, Is it Atomic Rooster? Is it Brewer's Two? It, it's not Atomic Rooster. Because any fool know, because there's no keyboard there at all. Uh, so if anybody wants to have a go at telling us, uh, you know, they, they can go on and they'll find that picture of that on the web and have a look at it. And uh, I, I remember it was years before I discovered who it was. And I was, I was kind of thrilled with myself for finding out. I've got the first issue of Q there. We're talking about Oh, this lovely. Um, and That's great. With a great cover line written by you, Up and Down with the Devil's Dandruff. It's about cocaine, in fact. It was yeah. that Paul Denoy who wrote that. Maybe Paul wrote that, yeah. Maybe I think he, he, I yeah, think he great. credit, credit where credit's due. Um, so we were talking last night about are we uh, exchanging uh, uh, WhatsApps or whatever about about uh, CDs and records and whether I'm starting to wonder if CDs might come back. You know. Well, you know, I I I I, I, I stand corrected. I think because I th I didn't think they did because there isn't much love for CDs. I've got a whole room full of CDs over there and I didn't even look at them last night. I was thinking of putting out odd things. Stuff for this, because I've got no real attachment to any of them. No, I know you. They, they just they don't. They don't have that kind of. They don't. They don't get scuffed and uh, written no, on. They, and they don't and, have it. You know, they, they don't have that I texture agree. that 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 the LPs have. But also, I think a lot of people don't have CD players, and so the value of them's going down because people just can't buy like DVD players. You can't really buy them. But your theory was that it's you going can to buy back, them. Well, I don't. I listen. I don't know. I wouldn't. All, all I know is that there was a long period of time, and I suppose the, from the late 80s, pretty much all through the 90s, when most of the long-playing vinyl records that people now coo over and pay 25, 35 pounds for, those same records sat unloved and passed over in the bargain bins of every record shop and every charity shop in the country. Nobody wanted those records at all because everybody was just keen on CD. They just moved to the new thing. That was suddenly where all the value was. And now the same things happen with CD. And so presumably, why, it's like anything to do with history. It's like, um, you know, forgive me, <laughs> this might seem like a strange parallel. Yeah, go on. But I was talking to the headmaster of my, of my old school not long ago. And he said that he would tell me that Remembrance Day was a very big thing nowadays at schools. I said, when I went to the school in the 60s, Remembrance Day was barely marked. And you were surrounded by veterans of the First World War and the Second World War in those days. Veterans of the First World War, your grandparents, 
veterans Second World War were your parents. The None of whom were making a big song and dance None about it. None of whom made a big song and dance about it at all. For loads of very complicated Lots reasons. Lots of them. They certainly didn't want to remember it, actually. No, quite. In the case of my and, parents. And, um, and it's only when all those people die that suddenly people go, oh, hang on. Got to keep the flame this. alive. And exactly. So, and so something similar happened. This is a very you know, trite you know, was, uh, comparison. But something similar happened with long playing records. It's only when they stopped being part of the furniture that people thought, oh, they're quite exciting, aren't they? Yeah. And so what's, the same thing's happening with CDs. I don't think CDs will ever be as exciting. They're not as soulful. And, oh, no, it's the same old thing. If, they're ava- if things are available, you don't want them. And the moment they're not available, you think, hang on, that's got some but, value. But I have found, and I don't know if you found this, in the last three months, you know, and this is, I started... Taking, you know, taking a long playing record that I played every day and just, and just posting a picture of a different one on Instagram every day, which everybody seems to like. <laughs> they like the idea of, of that. And, uh, but you're using a lot of this spare, spare time and you suddenly you slow down and you focus a bit more. Yeah. And you're not thinking what's new, what's next. You're thinking about making more of what you already have. And I found myself... When I finally get into the West End of London, which I'd like to achieve at some point, um, I want to go and buy a few records. And there are a few records that I really want. You know, the, 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 the need to, to own has kind of grown in me in the last three months. There are not hundreds of them or anything like that, but, you know, there are a few things. Because now I've got to the point with music where I think, if I really like it, I want to own it. If I quite like it i'll stream it i'll rent it that, yeah. that's fine you know i'm perfectly happy i use streaming services but there are occasionally things that i really want i happen to be listening yesterday i, I happen to be listening to a, a new album by nora jones i've never been particularly struck with the nora jones record before but i played it, i thought my god this is good and i thought when you know when the lights come on <laughs> all over london <laughs> I'm going to go and buy the Nora Jones record. Nora right? Jones, one of the very few people to sell more records than her famous musical parent. There are very few of them, aren't there? Jeff oh. Buckley's another. Rufus Wainwright is another. Nora Jones, Ravi Shankar's daughter. I can't think of many more. And no, no, certainly not Paul Simon's son. No. Or, or, Ad, <laughs> or Adam, Adam Cohen. Cohen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, or, uh, you know, yeah, you, you can name you can name loads of them, but that's, that, that's the case. Favourite magazine cover I've found. Do you remember Spy Magazine? I do, yeah. Spy Magazine was a smart New York kind of satire lifestyle magazine of the, of the 80s and 90s. Edited but, uh, by the guy who went on to be the manager in Spinal Tap. No. Am I right? They, no, you're thinking of National Lampoon. Oh, was that, uh, was that National Lampoon? Sorry. Okay, Spy. The editors of Spy were Kurt Anderson and Graydon Carter. Graydon Carter, who went oh, on yeah, the editor yeah. of, of Vanity Fair, and they were just did very clever things. They were the people who kind of invented Donald Trump. They were the people who, who invented him as a figure of fun, and uh, they were the people who invented described him as a short fingered vulgarian. So every time, every time he was introduced. Short-fingered vulgarian Donald Trump. It was really funny. They used to have, every issue had the spy list, which would be a list of about a dozen famous people and didn't tell you why they were on the list. You just had to work it out. So it's a brilliant way of kind of libeling people. With Very libel. good. <laughs> which is the private eye ruse all about, I wonder why so is so, <laughs> so, so upset. Yeah, you know, yeah, Ryan yeah. Giggs seems to be yeah. awfully upset yeah, about some yeah, super yeah. injunction. That, yeah, exactly. Is my phone still? Oh, yeah. your phone's still ringing over that. Sorry, you're going to have to tolerate my phone ringing until, until it stops. And so I, I used to buy Spy whenever I was in New York, which is in those days quite often and uh, quite frequently. And uh, sadly, I've only kept one, but I'm so pleased because they did an issue devoted to that most difficult to visualize ideas, which is irony. Okay. And they had to visualize irony. Oh, is that the case? And this is how they ironic. did it. That's right. They and, did. And underneath, I remember that underneath his fingers, it says, quote and unquote. Am I right? <laughs> Isn't it ironic? It's yes, he does. It's his quote. That's right. And unquote. It's Chevy Chase just doing the kind of the air quote. 
isn't it ironic? That's a oh, that, genius cover. It's a brilliant cover. I'm so pleased that of all the ones I could have kept, that's the one I kept from March 1989. Terrific. The, the great spy magazine. That's remember, so good. Do you remember these? Uh, yes, I, yeah, yeah. Al it's, the album, album covers, yes, I've got album. some of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're mostly um, kind of Roger Dean, sort of Ozzy well, Beezer. Well, there's, there's all, uh, that's a, a double spread, page spread on nudes in those days. They're boxer, kind of, that's the boxer cover. That's the boxer cover. Nobody talks about that anymore. No, they don't. And, and my mother. And oh, my oh, mother. And it, you know, it was, it where, was just... Where Storm or Albury just drove off into the countryside to, to find the first field full of cows he could and took a photograph of cows. He drove north out of London and <laughs> first cow. Yeah. Took a bit free. Oh yeah, brilliant. And the and doors. Free and the doors. Yeah. And, you know, I remember when there was, that was, again, that was kind of one of those things that flourished in the hole where the internet now, now is. Because if you wanted to see an old cover of, a, I don't know what, of Cheap Thrills, Big Brother and the Holding Company, and you didn't have it, the only way to do it was find a book that had yeah. it. You know, you couldn't just, you couldn't, couldn't just a few clicks and, uh, and have it there, there with you. Um, have I shown you, from, if ever I want to remember the time when I had more money than cents, <laughs> oh, that's great. What, you bought that? No, you were given I that bought that, this. I bought this in Tower Records in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh. Uh, this is the Hanna Barbera Picnic Basket. Four CDs of the incidental music and sound effects to, you know, the Flintstones and Yogi Bear and the Jets and, and all those things. All put in the shape. That's fantastic. Supposedly. I've got one. Picnic Basket. I've got to show you what I've got here, which is, uh, this is a Louis Armstrong. Suchmo. Oh. Did, you, did you ever get a copy of this? No. It's, it's a whole suitcase with all the kind of wonderful kind of transatlantic oh, liner stickers on it. that a promotional thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's brilliant. When you open it up, you get... Um, hang on, let's have a look. You get sheet music. There we are. Sheet music. You got a whole fantastic book about it. It's just wonderful. The whole book about the Cotton Club and all that. Oh, but the whole thing and tons of CDs. And it comes, as I say, packaged in. A suitcase. That's, Isn't that marvellous? That's, that's beautiful. It's got to be worth having, isn't it? It didn't send you... It doesn't include a, 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 um, a, a ration of, um, of his favourite laxative, does he? Oh! Because <laughs> <laughs> Louis Armstrong, God bless him. Did he, he not promote he should, laxative? It shouldn't be Louis Armstrong. It's Lewis. And Lewis never, Armstrong. It's Louis Armstrong. Yeah. Um, but he used to... He used to... He was a great believer in... the. In uh, you know, moving his bowels, I suppose particularly the touring musician. That's a concern, no doubt yeah. about that. Yeah, but I think for him it was an obsession, wasn't it? It was. It was possibly an obsession, and he used to. He used to great great believer in it in some product called Swiss Chris. I think it was called. Uh, <laughs> and he t you know the advert once, where he which had a picture of him I think blowing the trumpet. And it was a full length picture of him in profile. Yeah, and he was just smiling at the camera. It is a characteristic way. And uh, the line was, Swiss Chris, Lewis says, leave it all behind you. <laughs> leave it all behind you. <laughs> Don't let the world, that's right. Don't let the bottom fall out of your world. Let the, yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's How brilliant. brilliant. That's very good. So, uh, that's, Can I show, I'm going to show you one yeah, terrible on, old record that one collects, you know, this is, this reminds me of a, oh, uh, just a time in my life that the, the, how complicated records were. This is one of those ones with the, like, like Led Zeppelin three with the kind of a three dimensional thing in the middle. God, yeah. But this reminds me of the first gig that I ever saw. And I have, I could try to find the picture of it, but I couldn't find the actual print, but I have got the picture as it appeared in a book. There you are. That's the first gig I ever went to. And that's the oh, photograph I took of the mighty stuff machine day. And, uh, what, the was the, what was the line? What was the line? The lineup then was uh, Mike Radcliffe, uh, Mike Radcliffe on the organ. It was uh, Hugh Hopper bass, Elton Dean uh, saxophone, and Robert Wilde. And Robert Wilde, Robert Wilde, Robert Wilde playing kind of with no shirt on, great mane of hair, a bottle of warm <laughs> leave for our milk. Oh, I remember it being so exciting because I'd, uh, you know, going to London was exciting enough, but going to the Roundhouse and all these kind of a. Uh, 
you know, the, the fragrant uh, uh, aroma of, of kind of damp, kind of, uh, you know, army surplus great coats. Uh, patchouli, patchouli oil. oil. Patchouli yeah. oil. <laughs> the guy in front of me had an afro, which was stuck full of lighted joysticks. I can remember oh. so exciting. <laughs> but it's just one of those things that really reminded me of getting this out, of that period that you go through as a yeah. teenager. My prog period, which lasted about three months, where I discovered Soft Machine and I would listen to nothing else. I would sit there with my mate in his attic and try just talking about chin stroking examination of, you know, what time is signature they might possibly be playing. It was <laughs> pathetic, really. And listen, I, did you and I, I was trying another, to think. by the way, that I think we've talked about a lot. This is uh, another major. Uh, 14, and 14 and 6. 14 6, I was ripped uh, off, yeah. wasn't I? I bought, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, Possibly. what a fantastic record. It's a great, so it's it's a great record. Trade, traffic, all those Beautiful guys. record. Yeah. Well, I, I was reading about the Dixie Chicks last night. Were you were you with me? Yeah, I was. The Shepherd's Bush Empire. You were, weren't you? So Shepherd's Bush Empire. We went to see the Dixie Chicks at the Shepherd's Bush Empire. It, well, I tell you what it was. It must be about nine, two. Uh, it was about two thousand and two, two thousand three. So the very must beginning be. of Word. I wrote a piece about it, and okay. they made this comment. And at, at the time, nobody took any notice. They, they, they made George a mild, mild comment about George Bush. Yeah, something that like that. We're really the, sorry our about country, our president. Yeah, we, they apologised about yeah, the They did. But it was very light thing. It didn't, you know, we sat there in the place and never thought anything of it at all. But of course, this gets back to America. The next thing we know, they're being banned by radio all over the United States. They're pretty much being burnt in effigy, aren't they? It kind well, of, they did that apology cover on the cover of, would it have been? People Entertainment Weekly. Weekly. Entertainment Weekly, where they're naked, with covered in various, they wrote all these various slogans and things on themselves. Do you remember that? I think so, but, but the point is it derailed their career and it took them ages to kind of come back. And But now I read that they're dropping the word Dixie from their name because of the ancient connotations with the Mason-Dixon line and the slave states yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and all, all that. And I just thought, <laughs> I thought two things. I thought, A... Where does this leave the Dixie hummingbirds and all the other <laughs> and all the other gospel groups who <laughs> got the word Dixie in their in their name? And B, it won't make a hapeth of difference. You know what I mean? So there's this group who are not wildly kind of political. It's just what's happened in the last twenty years has made it kind of impossible for groups like that to move. You know what I mean? If they go a bit too far that way. They get boycott over there, and if they go a bit too far that way, they yeah, get... it's classic. Firstly, it's the right wing that are objecting to them. Now it might be the left wing objecting to <laughs> They're left up in the middle, trying desperately they, hard not to offend they anybody. To, they have to go out in the public square, covered in sackcloth and ashes, you know, to kind I of know. repent, as if it's going to make any difference at all, you know. No. As if those Guardian readers are going to go, oh, I'll try a Dixie, I'll try a chicks record. Yeah, I mean, now, now the that they're chicks, the chicks, I might buy them. Yeah. yeah. Hang on. But for the years, chicks. I boycotted them because <laughs> for political reasons. Yeah. I know. Where's Unbelievably the, apologetic. Where's this going to leave the Dixie Dregs? Do you remember the Dixie Dregs? No, I don't know. Dixie Dregs are a kind of sub Allman Brothers kind of bogey band. You know, there's loads of groups with the word Dixie somewhere in their, in their title. You know, there's loads of Dixie songs, you know, and quite a number of them done by artists of colour. You know, I don't. <laughs> Well, all that stuff in the seventies, those bands that had a sort of confederate feel about them. The South will rise again, you know. Well, there was a, I think, yeah, I think you've got to be careful about that because, you know, I think a lot of those groups didn't want to be associated with that stuff. No, they didn't. They, no, they. But they, they, that became an association, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. I think it was. Just, yeah, I think it's not their Brit intention at all. I think in Britain we probably, yeah, were probably guilty of thinking, oh, it's a bit of a car harm harmless colour. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas it wasn't, you know. No, it wasn't. Uh, there's a lot more, a lot more to it than that. But uh, no, the, it's the idea of groups kind of editing their names in order to, you know, to deal with the latest kind of issues about the sensibility of the audience. I don't know, I don't know where. I, I don't know. Where will it end? Where will it end? Well, I don't know, but that's where we're going to end, aren't we? Okay. So this has been a word in your attic. Number 50, uh, are we going to continue, people ask? Are we, Mark? I think we are. Maybe not at such a relentless rate, but we certainly are, because it works. People like it. People have got stuff, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's popular. 
The nation are, needs it, though. There are, there are people's attics we still want to see inside, you know. So as long as that continues to be the case, watch this space.